I think that uh, you'll be blessed by this recital this afternoon. I know that uh, we've been very excited to, to uh, plan for it and prepare and to host it this afternoon. Uh, and looking forward to a great, great time of um, listening and a time of uh, enjoying together. Uh, so if you don't know me, my name is Ben Ewart. I'm the Minister of Worship at First Baptist Church. Uh, now this is not First Baptist Church, this is Oak Ridge Adventist. Uh, so we just want to express our gratitude to Oak Ridge uh, for hosting, helping to host this event and opening up their, um, their building for us this afternoon as well. So, Crescendo North America, what is that? Well, it's a very fledgling organization here on uh, this side of the pond. It's been going for quite a while in Europe, and it's a network for Christian professional musicians, jazz musicians, classical musicians, jazz musicians, uh, to support them in their work wherever they are. Uh, oftentimes it can be tough working in some environments where there aren't a lot of Christians, so it offers that support together for the mutual encouragement and, um, and support in that way, and also to bring together events like this uh, where uh, artists can share a little bit about their faith, share about the gospel, and also present some very high quality um, music as well. So that's a little bit about Crescendo North America, and there um, should be a, a a website listed there in the program that you can go to if you're interested in finding out more. Uh, now this event it itself is being um, offered by Julie uh, at no cost, free of charge. But if you're interested more in her ministry in particular, hope to offer ministries, you can visit the website that's listed there in the program. And if you'd like to donate to that ministry, information uh, to that end as well. Let's uh, keep going with a word of prayer before we welcome Julie to the stage. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this beautiful day. Thank you for the gift of music. Thank you for the blessing of uh, a vast, diverse tradition of music um, that we can hear today and that you've given us across the entire world and across the ages. We give you thanks for that gift. And, um, we ask for your blessing on this time. ask for your blessing on Julie. And uh, yeah, we pray that you'd be with us now as we sit and enjoy this recital. May those who are here to be blessed and um, all of our families in our hearts. Jesus, amen. So please uh, welcome with me Julie Lowe to the stage.
Well, considering a scherzo is a musical joke, did that sound very funny to you? Or lighthearted, perhaps? Jokes are supposed to be humorous and lift our spirits and put us in a good mood, right? Kind of like life. Isn't life supposed to be about enjoyable moments, fun memories, laughter? Or how about at least fair? I mean, if we're good people at heart, shouldn't that count for something? Well, unfortunately, life isn't always easy, is it? Things happen to us that we did not expect, and therefore we couldn't prepare for them. Who foresaw the sudden physical, mental, and financial chaos that the coronavirus caused worldwide? What about the devastating war in the Ukraine, which has killed thousands and created a complete Lockdown of international goods, of the flow of international goods, resulting in skyrocketing inflation, or even the cataclysmic earthquake in Turkey and Syria just last week. For me, my rug was pulled out from under me when my husband of 15 years suddenly announced that he wanted out of our marriage. I'd never experienced such pain as watching the effects of our broken family on our then two young sons, whom I love second only to God in heaven. A few years later, a regularly scheduled mammogram would reveal that I had invasive cancer. And now a family member is battling the disease. Have you? ever been hit with an unforeseen or unexpected life-changing event? Perhaps you've experienced the betrayal of a friend or the jolt of an unexpected job dismissal. How about financial ruin from the stock or housing market or the tragic loss of a beloved family member or friend? Whatever the situation, sometimes it seems like we're at the butt end of some cosmic joke, as if there was some kind of a hidden camera somewhere videotaping our reactions to the situations that we find ourselves in. Just ask Beethoven. In this last movement of his Appassionata Sonata, you can hear the throbbing, unbearable anguish that he was going through as he felt his, as he heard his, had his hearing, bathing, dealing. He poured his heart into his music, hoping against hope for a cure, a way out of his nightmare. But things only got worse until he was completely deaf. And yet, I believe that it was exactly this tragedy that personalizes Beethoven's music and raises it to a level incomparable to almost any other composer before or since.
know there's been many unjust comparisons between our next composer, Schubert, and his idol, Beethoven, with Beethoven always getting the upper hand. There's criticism almost to the point of ridicule that Schubert's simple, beautiful, lyrical compositions are somehow more feminine, and they pale beside the dramatic power of Beethoven's more masculine works. Yet both composers have earned an undisputed and well-deserved place in music history in their own right. Have you ever felt unappreciated or unfairly Sometimes the people closest to us have the capability to hurt us more deeply than they know and far more reaching than they deserve. For most of my life, I was told that someone else was better than me in just about any department, in academics, in music, in sports, for sure, or even Christianity or just life in general. In fact, I used to think that if I had a clone, she'd somehow be better at being me than I was. Of course, the divorce only magnified those feelings of unworthiness. But it really wasn't all my ex's fault. That was just part of a lifetime of dealing with people who couldn't seem to value me as a person. You ever felt like that? In those times, it's imperative that we see ourselves in the light of the one person whose opinion of us matters more than any other. We need to know that it's God who determines what we're worth. And I've got fantastic news for you. He says that you are worth the crucifixion and resurrection blood of his only son. One of the best illustrations I can give you of this comes from Reverend Dr. Ken Shigematsu, and I'll just paraphrase him. Suppose I give you this $500 Monopoly play money, and you crumpled it up. Well, I just throw it away in the trash. However, if I give you this $50 bill and you crumpled it up, spat on it, <coughs> or how about stomped all over it? Well, I just pick it up and save it. Why? Because the Bank of Canada, who issued it, says it's still worth $50, no matter what you do. Now, if you substitute your life for this bill, I hope that you can see it doesn't matter what life events may shake you. What friends may betray you? <coughs> or when people tell you you're nothing. God, your maker, looks at you and says, Hear it from me. You are worthy. You are valuable. You are important. And you are cherished by your maker.
you know, there are times when life is just so difficult. 2009 was one of those years for me. It began with the death of my mother-in-law and went on to the announcement that my husband did not love me anymore. Five days after breaking the news to our sons, he lost his job. And being Canadians without a green card, we were suddenly forced to leave the Seattle area and return to Vancouver within six weeks with an anguished teenager and a crushed preteen. Next came the financial shock when my ex cleared our bank account, leaving our sons and me with virtually nothing for almost a year. It was so hard trying to find piano students to teach during a recession after being out of the country and the workforce for nine years for the benefit of my husband's career. Then there was the emotional roller coaster of dealing with the false accusations from those closest to me that this divorce was somehow my idea and that my actions were not Christian. Rather than giving me the benefit of the doubt, they questioned the very authenticity of my faith. If I truly believed that God hates divorce, why was I going through one? However, by far, the most difficult part of all this was seeing its toll on our young sons, uprooting them from the only childhood home that they had ever known, leaving behind our beloved church family and our neighborhood friends. It was excruciating trying to help them adjust to new school systems where no one cared if you knew the capitals of the 50 states, but you didn't know the capital of your own province was Victoria. And all the while, all they could think of was that their parents were no longer together and they had to be shuffled back and forth between two residences often leaving their clothes at one place and their homework at another. Being the only safe person that they could vent to, I often took on their pain to give them some kind of emotional release from all that they were going through. But that only perpetrated the notion that I'd managed to let everyone down yet again. While the idea of suicide had occasionally crossed my mind when I was younger, the thought of ending my life now came up very many times. I'd cry out, oh God, just take me home. I can't take this anymore, and I just want to be with you. But Jesus, if I have to live another day here, you've got to help me. One of my favorite authors is Dr. Henry Blackaby, who wrote a devotional with his son Richard called Experiencing God Day by Day. And this devotional blasted hope through my darkness in a way which encouraged me as nothing else. He wrote, as you follow Jesus, you will face moments of great distress. You do not initiate them, but they arise from opposition or the intensity of your circumstances. If you are facing challenges that seem overwhelming, don't be discouraged. God has already foreseen them and prepared for them. There will be times when events around you will confuse you. Those in whom you've placed your trust will fail you. Others will abandon you. You will be misunderstood 
and criticized. In these times of distress, you must let scripture guide and comfort you. Allow them to reorient you to God, and he will guide you safely through your difficult moments. So I returned again to my Bible, and I prayed that God would show me how Jesus handled his difficult moments. The first revelation was that none of Jesus' disciples were of his immediate family. In fact, at one point, when told that his mother and brothers were out looking for him, he answered, whoever does the will of God is my brother, sister, and mother. Those whom Christ chose to walk with him were not necessarily blood relatives. And I began to see that God could use anyone to help me, not just my family. Then when the disciples deserted Christ at his darkest hour, God showed me that no one is immune to the effects of betrayal, not even Jesus. You know, people can claim all kinds of allegiance, but when the chips are down, if the closest friends of God can abandon him, it's safe to assume that anyone can abandon me too. Lastly, I noticed that Jesus handpicked Judas as one of his 12 disciples. Not because he didn't know what Judas was capable of in his betrayal. But on the contrary, Judas was chosen for that very reason. Christ knew the character and the heart of this disciple. But also the fact that in order for Jesus to get to the cross, be crucified for our sins, and there, thereby show his resurrection power. Judas was the key. That was the turning point of my darkness. I could allow the events of my life to sever my relationship with God. Perhaps I'd even be justified in that decision, given all that I'd gone through. but my justification wouldn't change anything. Could it possibly be that all the trials that I was going through were exactly the Judas events that I needed in order to give over my shattered and broken life as it now stood to Jesus so that God could resurrect his life within me anew? I chose to believe, yes, God allowed his son to be unjustly crucified for me, for all of my sins and all of those committed against me. He will not allow anything to negate what Jesus went through on my behalf. When he raised his son up from the pits of hell, he proved that there is absolutely nothing that he cannot and will not do in order to raise me up from my hell because I have his resurrected life within me now. If you imagine your life to be like this plastic strip, you can see how flimsy it is how it's weakened whenever I bend it. However, when this steel rod is placed inside, no matter how I try, I cannot break it. 
That's kind of what it means to have the resurrected life of Christ within you. You know, circumstances and people can try to break you. But when you have Christ's life within you, you have the strongest core possible. All the peace and love and wholeness that belong to God can now be yours. And you can begin to have this life today. Now, I don't know what you've gone through in your life. Tolstoy said, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. But there is one God who has this message for you. He sees you, and he loves you to the cross. And he wants to guide you through this life that he's given you on earth and into eternity. Throughout history, millions have found life's hope meaning and joy on their journey with Jesus. One of them was Johann Sebastian Bach. This Christian composer was well acquainted with the pain of death and sorrow, but he never lost sight of his Lord and Savior. His faith that Jesus was with him in every moment gave him life and the hope that inspired in his music. My life has not always been easy, but I'm constantly amazed at God's incredible grace to me. In him, I have found a strength and a perspective which have allowed me not only to survive, but to live my life with the wholeness, powerful joy, and peace which will never be found elsewhere. If you would like to have the security in your life, 
there will be people with me like Pastor Ben and I, who will be with me at the front of, after today's concert, who are ready to address your questions and to pray with you. I thank Oak Ridge Adventist Church for allowing us to have this afternoon together. I thank First Baptist Church and Crescendo North America for arranging today's concert. And I thank you for allowing me to share my hope with you. May God bless you as only he can. Thank you so much, Julie. Would you come up here for, for a second here? Thank you so much. Thank you very much for sharing your, your life experiences with us. I know it's just deeply touching and uh, the way that God has worked in your life and how you brought that through uh, with your music. Uh, now I know that Julie had said that she might give an encore. Um, I came up here and interrupted the clapping, but um, do you think that we could ask her for a... Yeah. <laughs> 